to the inquisitorial representative. My lord, as per your recent instructions, I have compiled the following briefing concerning the upheaval within Eldari society and the rising of the supposed god of the dead, or the Yanid, and its followers the cult of the Yanare, for dissemination throughout our glorious organization, with your approval. To avoid confusion, I have adopted the use of the term Aldare, which seems to be the trend amongst many on Terra currently, despite being personally appalled at the use of the Xeno's tongue in polite conversation, as opposed to the more traditional name Eldar, used in low Gothic throughout our Imperium for untold millennia. I would like to add that having spent more than my fair share on the front line, I have a preference for using the terminology of the common grunt guardsmen, and oft times refer to them simply as knife ears. I find this name pleasing, as it is not only accurate, but conveys the proper level of human contempt for this most degenerate and perfidious of Xenos races. The Sign of the Phoenix The Yenare are the newest faction within Eldare society. Despite their status as newcomers, their aesthetic is that of the ancient Eldare, those decadent seafarers who predate even the elders of Komura. Those who join the Yenare cult are exclusively Eldare, for the race would not deign to speak of its secrets, even to the most learned human. The Yenare are devoted to Yened, the god of the dead, a macabre deity on the threshold of ascendance. The colours their leaders wear reflect that, They sport rich apparel and complex baroque armour in the deep reds, blacks and purples, reminiscent of the ghost halls and memorial gardens of the ancient empire. Some of those Ashuriane, Harlequins and even Drukare that join their cause abandon the colours of their former organisations entirely, adopting the hues worn by Yvrin and the Visarch to better proclaim their allegiance to the cult. These are the individuals who see only one path forward for the Eldare race, that of utter dedication to the deathly creed of the Anare. Those who are more recent converts or who wish to still maintain or pay homage to their former beliefs and ideals may instead sport a ribbon of deep crimson upon their upper arm or thigh. This is taken from the funeral practices of the ancient Aldare, who would wear such an adornment to show their sorrow for a departed family member or beloved companion, a warning sign to others that they might be allowed to grieve alone. For the Yonari, however, it is worn as a symbol of resolution and dignity. They will go to the grave willingly, for they know that each death will lend their race another priceless moat of power with which to defeat Slanesh. The following missive from Lassiter Mung of the Ordo Xenos may prove illuminating and offer some context to the following report. Eldar Prophecy Like ghouls in the dark, the wicked ones gather, drawn to a tragedy unfolding. Warnings twice given across the span of time, stifled by pride and by hatred. The strands of fate shall grow taut at the dawn of the Rana Dandra. The death of all Eldar looms large, but fate can be twisted and even broken. One shall walk the forked path, a threefold truth to weave the skine. Nemesis of she who thirsts, opener of the seventh way. Long dead souls gather behind the rebirth of ancient days, drinking but not consuming, taking in but giving new life. In the heat of Cain's wrath, 
our sorrow will be reforged, our destiny becomes a weapon fit to slay a goddess. The pallid moon of unnumbered voices shall turn into a sun, lit by the flames of unjust wars, a crucible of souls and dreams, the stolen seers amassed, gather unto them the dead. Legion, they drift within the sands, their voices raised as one. Lambent glow becomes shining beacon, death kneel rises to herald's cry. The blackened shield becomes the sword, the yearning void becomes the path. The god of the dead calls out, a whisper so fierce and strong, it shall hush the stars for ever. The Prophecy of the Hidden Path, translated by Lassiter Mung. As the last surviving member of the Mung dynasty's Xeno lexicographers and a member of the Order Xenos, it is incumbent upon me to delve into the mysteries of alien texts, and in particular those of the Aldari. One of several prophecies recounted to me by my delirious captive since the administration of the grave Lotus Elixir, the above text can be interpreted in a thousand different ways. Yet with my family's long study of the double meanings and mythic resonances of the Aldari texts, I have gleaned insight into the excerpt. It is plausible that the warning twice given refers to a parley between Aldari and the agents of the Imperium, where the former warned the latter of the threat posed by the ruinous powers. In my research, I have uncovered previously sealed data scrolls that speak of one seer of Ulfran, perhaps a corruption of Ulfwi and the name of its chief psyker, visiting with the Primarch of the Third Legion, known as the Phoenician, amongst other names. This warning was perhaps reprised during the clash at Corheria, reported to the Ordo Xenos via the Death Watch strike force of Captain Artemis. That singular moon is referred to in the text as a pallid moon of unnumbered voices. Though given the desolation of the planetoid, I am at a loss as to the nature of the voices. Perhaps they are the stolen seers referred to later in the passage and it is to those same throats that give vent to the death knell that rises up to Herald's cry. It is my contention that the manifold geists of the dead referred to here are seen as a potential measure of salvation, one that will turn the Aldari back from the brink of extinction. As for the blackened shield becoming the sword, that much is easy to pass, it refers to the Death Watch, amongst whom the black shields can be found, and the fact they took battle to the moon of Coheria when the Eldari were attempting to use the stolen seers for some arcane ritual. Perhaps, if they had paid more attention to their own prophecy, they would have been ready to block the blow of that allegorical sword when Captain Artemis and his kill team leveled their death blow at the command elements of the Xenos ritualists. The term Rana Dandra, according to my predecessor, Obelis Mung, refers to the extinction-level event the Aldari are convinced will befall them, and may it fall soon by the Emperor's grace. The individual referred to as the one who shall walk the forked path, I believe to be Yevren, the figurehead of the Yenari, detailed in the records of the Fortress of Hera. That she is listed as the nemesis of she who thirsts, the Aldari term for redacted. The youngest of the chaos powers is promising indeed, for this reason alone, I posit that the lethal sanction levelled against her by Inquisitor Autoria should be repealed. Record ends. The Yunare, also known as the Reborn, are a rising force in the galaxy. They believe the Aldari can be saved from the brink of oblivion by the rise of Yened, the God of the Dead. By harnessing the strange spirit magic of this ascendant deity and drawing upon the energies of the slain, the Yanare burst into the fray with exceptional vigour and aggression. 
There is an obscure school of thought within Aldari society that states when every member of their race has died, the souls that have been saved from Slanesh's curse will form a gestalt, awakening a new god with the power to defeat their godly nemesis forever. Some amongst the seers and scholars in Aldari society believe that time of ending is nigh, but that not all Aldari must die to escape Slanesh's clutches. There is a new hope against the darkness. Somewhat amongst these are the seers of Ulthwi, whose psychic machinations have led to a premature awakening for the Aldari god of the dead. Soon after Yanid was first roused from slumbering potentiality, a fraction of his will and power was imparted to Yvren, the daughter of Shades. An exile from Beltan, after following the paths of the warrior and the witch, Yvren had walked every corner of Eldari society. She had become an outcast, then a corsair commander, and finally, after a costly mutiny, fallen from grace entirely, to become exiled from even the most roguish of Eldari subcultures. She eked out a new existence from the haunted streets of Kamura, fighting tooth and nail to become part of the witch cults. Such was her skill as a warrior that she rose to the rank of succubus. It was in the white-hot crucible of arena conflict that she crossed the threshold of death and found herself infused with the energies of Yanid. That was the crux point of fate that saw the birth of a new creed. In one Mind-blasting moment, Yvrin became a conduit for deathly energies, invested with the ability to pass on her esoteric skills to those who joined her new and macabre doctrine. With the aid of the mysterious swordsman known as the Visarch, Yvrin cut her way free from the demonic infestation that rocked Kamora soon after her ascension. She made her way back to the craft world of her birth, ripping free one of the fabled crone swords from the wraithbone skeleton of Beltan, and in the process, fracturing the world ship into skeletal shards of its former glory. The crone swords are Eldari legends. There were five of these ancient weapons, and then when gathered together... They bear a terrible and macabre power over death itself. It is a well-known myth that Heg's screaming daughters hounded the war god Cain until he agreed to cut off her hand, thereby allowing the crone to partake of her own blood and the knowledge held within. Few know the more obscure chapter that followed that myth, the tale that five deadly blades were forged, one from each of the crown's talons, and strewn across the ancient Eldari Empire as a defence against the final doom of their race. These swords were thought lost to the mists of time, but they are very real. In the mythic cycles of the Aldari, the father of Mora Heg's daughters is referred to as Kalish Varalanthian, or the death god yet to be. It is likely that Eldred and Cassandorus took this as a sign that Yanid's power was waiting to be claimed, and that they had the means to locate and wield the swords. They might wield a fraction of this power in the material realm. Perhaps only Mora Heg know the truth. And by providing foci for Yanid's nascent power, set in motion a chain of events that would unfurl when the Eldari needed it most. As ever with Eldar mythology, it is difficult to discern what is true and what is merely poetic license. The shattering of Beltan's infinity circuit caused a vast explosion of psychic energies that caused warp vortices to spiral into being around the stricken craft world. 
but also gave a focal point for the Eldari god of the dead to manifest his avatar in real space. So was born the Inkan, a being both beautiful and terrible, whose mastery over deathly energies were the supernatural powers of Yenid himself. Since that fateful day, the triumvirate of Yenid has spread word of the nascent god's ascension to the mightiest of craft worlds, the far-flung fleets of the Corsairs and the dark corners of Camorre, and even the Exodite worlds. A great many Aldari, hailing from every sub-faction and allegiance, save the most conservative and entrenched, have joined their cause. No abstract philosophy is this, for the effects of their new deity can be seen manifesting around them. The reborn can draw upon the souls within the spirit stones they wear to bolster their own abilities, can siphon the powers of those slain nearby to invigorate their attacks, and turn their foes to ashes with the strange weapons and psychic powers they wield. They have learned the secrets of the dead, bringing them closer to their ancestors and the lost glories of their fallen race. Tragically, many see the Yanari as corrupted by the very demonic forces they seek to thwart. Others believe they are already dead inside, and perhaps they are right. Though the reborn seek to reforge Aldari society in Yanid's name, and restore the glory of the ancient Aldari race, their arrogant coercion of the metaphysical power that is the hallmark of their species has alienated as many factions as it has united. Worse still, the danger they pose to the Dark Gods has seen the forces of chaos, and especially those of Slanesh, rise up like a tsunami of devilry to consume the lands before them. Conflict and destruction erupt in the Yanari's wake, and wherever they go, one thing stands out as a stark truth above all. As well as bringing hope, the reborn bring death, and in great measure. The Rise of a New Power Amidst the twilight years of their race, the Aldari had found a new hope, something that could potentially stave off their doom altogether. In this, the leaders of the Yanare saw a chance to unify their long-scattered race as one, healing old wounds and beginning a new era of progress. The Aldari had witnessed tumultuous change at the tail end of the 41st millennium, being a race blessed with psychic abilities and genuine precognitive power, the promise of cataclysm did not go unheralded. As ever, the Aldari sought to turn the twists of fate to their own ends. The high farseer Eldred Ulthran, more than any other, over the last few hundred years of his immense lifespan, Ulthwan had detected a confluence of soul energy whenever he had cast his mind into the afterlife of the Infinity Circuit. The lingering essences of the dead were blending together into a slow but discernible heartbeat, like that of some impossibly huge giant slumbering in the endless depths of the Aldari soul. It was the nascent essence of a god of the dead, Yenid. In that great potentiality, Eldred Ulthran saw hope. It was the pathfinders of Aliatok, led by Illic Knight Spear, who brought word to Ulthwi of the strange crystal moon of Kohiria, uh, shortly after the nature of that moon became clear, Eldrad set in motion a cascade of events that would shape the galaxy. The High Farseer projected his consciousness across the stars, enlisting the aid of a Harlequin troop from the Midnight Sorrow. Led by the enigmatic figure known as Inriam Spectre, the Harlequins were foremost amongst those Aldari who believed that chaos could 
be defeated and that Yanid could one day help their race transcend their ancient doom. The Crystal Moon Together, the High Far Seer and his Harlequin allies enacted a great ritual upon Coheria that saw a crystal conduit established between the Aldari craftworlds and the physically resonant crystal sands that covered much of it that moon. His plan was nothing less than to channel the foremost souls of the Eldari Infinity Circuit into the same place at the same time, in doing so, awakening Yanid long before the natural point of its culmination. This was an act fraught with peril, for it would plunge all the craft worlds into darkness and feasibly lead to their sp- spiritual destruction. Yet it also held the potential to see the Eldari race, living and dead, united for one glorious moment that could see Slanesh slain forever, and his power usurped, taken for the good of his people, rather than their downfall. In Aldred's eyes, it was a gamble worth taking. The consequences of that great risk were profound. The moon of Coheria was under imperial control, though it was considered minor and near worthless compared to the planet it orbited, Port Demesnus. The Aldari of Ulfwe launched a fierce assault upon Demesnus, orchestrated by Eldred as a distraction to draw attention from his true agenda. It summoned an Imperial response, predictably. The Imperium marshaled every asset it could spare from the system to rush to the defence of its primary holdings. But there was one whose hunter's instinct was strong enough to detect the feint. Watch Captain Artemis of the Death Watch, a specialist in the art of Xenos hunting, took his kill team to Coheria and there engaged Aldred Ulthran at the critical point of his grand ritual. Just as the moon's sands were thrumming with the psychic energy of countless Eldari spirits, blood was spilt on both sides, and Aldred's Harlequin allies were cut down. When the deaf jester known as Inriam Spectre was held at a gunpoint, he asked his captor, Captain Artemis, if he could put aside his hatred in order to deal a death blow to a far greater mutual foe, the Chaos God Slanesh. The only answer he received was a bolt round to the head. Captain Artemis is a true hero of our Imperium. The ritual, so close to completion, went haywire. The psychic emanations intended to awaken Yanid echoed out into the void, but they were unfocused, for Aldrad had been forced to fight for his life against the Death Watch in order to escape Coheria at all. The great gamble had failed, but for one aspect, a tiny moat of consciousness that arched through space, eventually coming to land within the dark city of Kamura, the Night of Revelations. In the arena known as the Crucibal, a grand clash was occurring between the famed Lilith Hesperex and the Succubus Yvren. So far had her fame spread that, as well as rich corsairs and outcasts, even a troop of harlequins was amongst the crowd. Some had touted Yvren as skilled enough to face even Lilith Hesperax in personal combat. This claim was usually a death sentence for even the most skilled warriors, for Lady Hesperax was so immensely gifted in the art of combat that those who faced her usually died in seconds. Yet there was something special about this fashionable new challenger. It was in the white heat of arena conflict that Yvren crossed the threshold of death and found herself infused with the energies of Yenid. That night, Yvren had fought fellow witches and hellions, even Incubi, 
She had used every ounce of her skill to defeat a captive, tyrannid hive tyrant bred from the strains of Kraken and Leviathan. They were taken from the planet of Valador. After turning its attendant guard beast to dust with death thrusts of her husk blade, she disintegrated the giant leader beast in single combat. At the fight's climax, she duelled Lilith Hesperex herself, but found herself outclassed and was mortally wounded for her trouble, left as unworthy prey to die slowly of her injuries. But it was the subsequent clash with a stick-thin, elegant priestess of Mora Hag that was to seal her fate. The new opponent's body was bound up in a complex net of black silk, the icon of the long-dead crone goddess Mora Hag, emblazoned upon her forehead. Yevrin had seen that ceremonial garb before, in the statue gardens of her native Baeltan. Her new challenger wore the raiment of an ancient priestess from before the Aldari Empire had fallen. The needle of the crone priestess darted out, and for a few seconds, Yevren was forced onto the defensive. It was as if she was being assailed by the rapiers of two master fencers at once. On any other night, Yevren could have beaten the priestess without breaking a sweat, but she had been so sorely wounded by Lilith. Dismay took hold as she felt her strength draining away, her every blow weaker than the last. It was at this point in time that the culmination of Aldred Ulthwan's ritual of awakening sent a moat of deathly power screaming across reality. As small as a meteorite splinter, but with impossible potential, its searing arc brought it straight to the Crucible. Burning across Kamura like a shooting star, the moat of Yenid's consciousness slammed into Yvrain just as she found herself crossing the threshold between life and death. For there, the awakening god Yenid could reach her and imbue her with his divine power. Perhaps it was because she was at that instant beyond the boundary of death that she attracted Yenid's gaze. Perhaps it was because she had walked so many paths, thereby living a life reminiscent of the lost ancestors of her race. Those Eldari whose souls reincarnated naturally upon their death. Whatever the reason, the experience of becoming God-touched was transcendental. Though it granted her only a sliver of the nascent deity's deathly potential, Yevrin held more power in that moment than any other Aldari alive. She had become the first, the most potent of the Yenari. This crux point of fate saw the crowd gathered in the arena suddenly blasted by a tsunami of deathly power emanating from Yevrin herself. In one mind-shattering moment, Yevren became a conduit of deathly energies, invested with the ability to manipulate spirit energy and pass on her esoteric skills to those who joined her cause. It was the genesis of a new power in the galaxy, the birth of its high priestess, and the inception of a macabre religion that thousands of souls have subscribed to since that day. Yevren's transformation was a boulder hurled into a stagnant pond, with the mysterious figure known as the Visarch fighting his way to her side. She cut her way through the anarchy of the rioting Crucible crowd. The destructive ripples of that event flowed outwards, causing the metaphysical quake of a warp disjunction. During the resultant demonic invasion, Yevrin escaped Kamura, leaving utter disaster behind her. For the coming of her apotheosis had seen the half-reality of the dark city torn wide open. The demon creatures had slunk through in its wake. The Yanaris' flight through the webway led Yvren to the Exodite worlds. 
several Eldari craft worlds and even a crown world in the Eye of Terror. In each location she left dissent and schism behind her. Nowhere was the effect of her actions more clear than on craft world Beltan, where she raised a new manner of being, the Avatar of Yenid. To many Asuriani, Yevren was a herald of disaster, but none sought to snuff out her flame as much as the supreme overlord of Kimura, whose carefully maintained status quo she had so thoroughly shattered. Astrabal Vex agents were sent to end her disruption for good, including a mercenary force headed by Drazar, the Master of Blades. But to others, Yevrin represented hope, and thousands of Aldari joined the cause of the Yenari, amongst them the Phoenix Lord Jain Zar. The skeins of fate crossed and crossed again, until not even the most skilled far-seers could determine the optimum path through the maze of causality. The future was shrouded, and all the more disturbing for it. The Era of the Decidian The events at the close of the 41st millennium saw the galaxy all but split in half by the celestial cataclysm the Aldare call the Decidian. It brought with it a rise in etheric phenomena, and being part of a psychic race, the Yanare were profoundly affected. The Cicitrix Maledictum, that great tear across the fabric of time and space, has further divided the Eldari race. After the coming of the Great Rift, the Ashuriani sent out psychic communications to every one of their craft worlds, taking stock of the sheer scale of the disaster that had befallen them. Two of their number did not respond, their psychic traces dwindling with every passing night. Though to an empire as large as the Imperium, this would be considered acceptable losses, for it counts a million worlds and more in its number. For the Aldari, it was a cost so high it wrenched at the heart. To lose two entire craft worlds was a bitter pill indeed. Perhaps one day they would return, just as Craftworld Altansar was drawn from the gullet of the warp by the odysseys of the phoenix lord Morgan Ra. But for now, those Craftworlds were gone. Whether their spirits enriched the growing gestalt of Yenid, none save the whispering god himself now. Far from uniting the survivors against the common enemy of chaos as Yvrin had hoped, the rift between the space-going nations of the Aldare grew all the wider. Their scattered craft worlds were not warp-capable, for the Aldari would never risk their souls by willingly braving the hellish dimensions of the Empyrean. To do so would be tantamount to suicide, for it would court the hellish attention of Slanesh, called She Who Thirsts, that entity which prizes Aldari's souls over all others. Neither can the Asuriani craft worlds traverse the webway, that labyrinthine dimension through which smaller Aldari craft traverse the galaxy's hidden paths. Even the meagerest craft world is the size of a small moon, and there are few, if any, warp gates large enough to accommodate them. The Harlequins still use secret ways for the Aldari to slide through the vast reaches of space in relative safety, and those who have converted to the Yonari cause guide Yavrin and her growing congregation through the labyrinth dimension whenever they can, but the coming of these ruinous times have rendered even the quietest space lanes fraught with peril. The Aldari have become a race truly divided, and in so being, caught a new fall. In the cultural hearts of the Aldari Empire, the wound of the Great Rift, or Dathidian in the Aldari tongue, festered and ran deep. 
No civilization could look upon a night sky mauled by the energies of chaos and not feel affected by it. To a race as sensitive to psychic phenomena as the Aldari, the scar in the heavens was a constant dull ache in the mind, a reminder of all they had lost. Perhaps it would never have existed at all were it not for the formation of the Eye of Terror, born from the sickening cataclysm of Slanesh's birth. That stark reminder of their darkest hour gnawed at the mind, making your friends claims of another god yet to be born, though this time as a saviour, ring hollow. Across the galaxy, nightmares of guilt and doubt racked the Aldari race. Even the callous and self-serving Drakari were affected, forced to admit their way of life was under dire threat. A new era of war began as the turmoil within was turned into merciless strikes against ancient enemies, new foes and former allies. Much of the blame for the new disaster was put at the door of the mysterious death cult known as the Yunari, especially upon Beltan. There, the populace had been divided between fervent support for Yvren and the outright condemnation that followed her visitation, coinciding as it did with the invasion and subsequent fracture of the Craftworld's Infinity Circuit. Yet the new era brought hope too, a new strand of fate that some believed would lead to the Aldari race rising to greatness once more. The being that Yvren summoned from within Baltan's broken wraith-bone skeleton was an avatar of a sort, and for an avatar to exist, a god had to have risen in power for it to epitomize. The entity known as the Inkan was proof that the whispering god was real, and hence that he could perhaps save their souls from she who thirsts once and for all. A Psyche Inflamed Since the Great Rift split the galaxy, the psychic powers that all Aldari possess to some degree have burdened in different ways. It is generally accepted among the farseers of the craft worlds that this is a direct result of the Dethidian introducing a vast bleed of ethereal energy into the galaxy. Of all the Aldari, the Craftworlders are the most in tune with psychic matters. Without the PATH system, that cultural process by which an Aldari focuses his or her mind upon a single pursuit or skill to avoid the temptation of all others, the Ashuriani may have found this flare of psychic activity disturbing and possibly even disastrous. Yet the discipline of the path was developed precisely to turn the Aldari mind into a fortress against such unfettered activity. Of all the sentient races in the galaxy, the Ashuriani could be said to have ridden out the swell of psychic energy the best. Indeed, their entire culture was built around methods of discipline, guardianship and self-denial, in case they let their worst excesses rise from within to eclipse their sanity once more. Those Aldari who trod the witch path found their prophetic glimpses escalating into full and potent visions, magnifying their ability to pass the skeins of future fates and react accordingly. On every craft world, their runes of warding burned out at a daunting rate, the protective symbols being used up almost as fast as they could be regrown from psycho-reactive material. But for now at least, the psychic threat posed by their demonic nemesis was held at bay. With this new influx of psychic energy came other new abilities, and many Aldari subcultures found themselves able to draw on power from within. Even those who traditionally honed the use of the physical over the mental found their talents blossoming when they brought the two into balance. The Yanari were no exception. 
wherever the energies of death gathered thick, the converts to Yenid's cause literally breathe them in, harnessing that invisible power released upon death to empower them, so they fought with blurring speed and incredible dexterity, even for one of the Eldari race. Potential turned to talent, and talent to mastery, mastery to supernatural prowess. The stage was set for the sacred phoenix of the Eldari race to rise once more. My lord, I have compiled character profiles, so to speak, of the most pertinent information regarding the three most well-known members of this growing cult of death. Yevrin, emissary of Yenid. The High Priestess of the Yenari is Yevren, the Daughter of Shades. She was the first to feel the energies of the Whispering God empower her. Her appearance is grand and exotic, her gown-like finery worn over a sleek witch suit so she can shook off her regalia before darting out to deliver a killing blow. Soon after Yenid was first roused from slumbering potentiality, a fraction of his will and power was imparted to one single soul. Chosen by fate, Yevrin was in spirit the closest living thing to the ancient Eldari that had existed before Slanesh erupted into being. Yavrin had walked the warrior path early in her life, for a part of her nature is warlike and thrills at the spilling of blood. She became a dire avenger, studying the arts of Cain under the tutelage of the Exarch Larraine. The two formed a bond of surpassing closeness during that time, so much so that when she left the shrine to walk the witch path, Larian could not forget her. That connection in itself was to divert the course of fate for both Yvrain and Larian later in life. An exile from Baeltan, after following the paths of the warrior and the witch, Yvrain had roamed in every corner of Eldaria society. She became an outcast, crossing the stars with a band of secretive rangers and learning the art of patience. Still, she felt she had not settled in her rightful place. Whilst travelling abroad the elegant winged ship known as the Lanathrial, Yevren felt the call of the void upon her soul and forsook her loose band of outcast allies to join the crew. Year by year, battle by battle, she garnered more status, for she had a vicious streak and a sense of opportunism that saw her rise quickly through the ranks. Taking the name Amharak, which means pitiless one in the Aldare, ultimately she became the Corsair commander, plying the space lanes at the helm of the Lanathrial. Yet there were those amongst the crew who saw Yvrine as a pretender, one who donned the trappings of each new life as a troubadour would don a new costume, without truly committing to the role. Even Yvrine had to admit the truth of that notion. She was in part a chameleon, and with every new victory sought out a fresh challenge. Finally, after her rivals organised a mutiny against her, Yevrin was sent into exile whilst her corsair fleet was docked at Port Villafact in the Dark City. The new captain of the Lanathrial, Lord Aracleo, had cause to regret his decision soon after, for Yevrin was a gifted leader. Without her connections, the corsair fleet's fortunes began to suffer. And by then, it was too late. Stripped of her grandeur, humbled by those who once called her mistress, Yevren eked out a new existence within the haunted streets of Kamura, narrowly avoiding becoming one of the starveling creatures known as the Parched. She fought tooth and nail to become part of the witch cults, and through sheer ability, earned her place. Known in Kimura as the Daughter of Shades, Yevren was a favourite in certain wealthy circles. 
She was not a true Camorite, and hence was interestingly controversial. Famed for her lightning transformation from stately elegance to a whirlwind of violence when her ire was raised. This gory retribution had happened upon the bridge of Lanathriel, within the trophy galleries of Archon Abrahak, and even on the Seer's Bridge of Beltan. Yevren's mercurial temperament had endeared her to those who respected decisive violence. In essence, the vast majority of the Dark City's inhabitants. Such was Yevren's skill as a combatant, refined along the path of the warrior and broadened in scope as a corsair queen, that she rose through the ranks of the witch cults to become a succubus. Some say this was through pure skill. Some say it was a direct result of the patronage of Lady Melisse, the scheming and impeccably dressed Archon, who was once a paramour of Astrobal Vex. Whatever the reason, it was Yvren's role during the Night of Revelations that saw a grievous blow dealt to Vex rule. After her transformation in the Crucibal, Yevren cut her way free from the demonic infestation that rocked Kimura soon after her ascension. She made her way back to the craft world of her birth, Beltan, and in the process set in motion the events that saw the world's ship fractured into skeletal shards of its former glory. The shattering of Beltan's infinity circuit caused a vast explosion of psychic energies that caused warp vortices to spiral into being around the stricken craft world, but also gave a focal point for the Eldari god of the dead to manifest his avatar in real space. A great many Eldari have since joined Yevren's cause, including Ashuriani, Drukari, Harlequins, and even a strange psychic familiar known as a Grinx. In battle, she is more fearsome than ever, wielding the crown sword Kavir, the Sword of Sorrows. She can turn an enemy to ash with the slightest kiss of the blade. Stranger still, the powers of their new deity, Yanid, can be seen manifesting around her as she fights. Yavren's reborn can tap the power of the souls within their spirit stones, or even those slain nearby to enhance their abilities in combat. They wield strange weapons and formidable psychic powers that can turn their foes to dust in an instant. They have learned the secrets of the dead, bringing them closer to their ancestors and the lost glories of their fallen race. However, many see Yuvrin and her Yenare as corrupted by the very demonic forces she seeks to thwart, whilst others believe she is already dead inside. The Visarch, Sword of Yenid Yavrin's guardian is the mysterious swordsman known only as the Visarch. In him is an echo of the Eldari at the height of their power. Acting as Yavrin's escort, teacher and confidant, he is a crucial linchpin in the Yanari's inner circle. Any who would harm his mistress must first meet him blade to blade. No enviable task for even the most skilled warrior. The Visarch is Yevren's sworn champion. He epitomizes the matchless grace of the Aldari in form as well as deed. Clad in Baroque armor of the ancient Bal Anshok style, the Visarch wears many faces upon his battleplate, just as he channels many souls within his mortal form. When one personality's skills are not suited to his immediate need, another rises to the fore, lending him a critical edge. The Visarch can strike with the sure sword of an Exarch, channel the lethal rampage of an Incubus, or use the acrobatic prowess of a witch, darting through the enemy lines to leave only twitching limbs and dismembered torsos in his wake. Those who scream in defiance soon find themselves robbed of their voices. For the crown sword he wields, Ashuvar, the sword of silent screams, 
brings a deathly hush when drawn in anger. The Visarch was once known as the Exarch Larian, but since encountering the Daughter of Shades, he has become something stranger and more unsettling than one of Cain's shrine keepers. Once an Exarch of considerable standing upon Beltan, the Visarch taught Yvrin in her former life as an aspect warrior. Seeing much potential in her acrobatic skills, he had been greatly saddened when she had left his shrine. He could barely accept that she had forsaken the way of the dire avenger in favour of the witch path, but when word reached him that she had chosen the way of the outcast, and eventually a life of murder and moral decrepitude in Kamura, his spirit broke. Though he would not admit it to himself, the depths of feelings for Yvrin diverted his course. In a nigh unprecedented lapse of tradition, the Visage left his shrine in the hands of his foremost disciples, breaking the faith of the Exarch tradition to follow Yvrin along the dark thread of fate she had made for herself. Posing as an incubus, he fought his way to a position of prominence in the Dark City, the better to keep watch over his ward. In the Grand Shrine of the Coiled Blade, he joined those accomplished killers, sometimes called the Scarlet Incubi, by those afraid to name them. Larian struck down the Clavex after a grueling duel and took the role as right of conquest, Perhaps it was this act that saw him embody the ancient Aldari more than most. Perhaps it was his ceaseless study of the arts of death that drew him close to Yenid. Perhaps it was fate alone. From that moment on, however, Larian found a deep and spiritual connection with the Whispering God. He has served him ever since, and in doing so, been drawn to Yvrin's side once more. The Inkan, Avatar of Yenid. Both Yvrin and the Visarch are dwarfed in stature by the towering, swirling entity known as the Inkan. It is a figure both strangely beautiful and terrifying to behold. If this is truly the Aldari's saviour, it is a dark one indeed. The Inkan is an extremely unsettling entity, a manifestation of morbid energies that communicates only through death and the manipulation of spiritual energy. Much like the Aldari's nemesis, the deity of unbridled excess known as Slanesh, the Inkan is androgynous, for death takes all in the end, regardless of age, gender or status. It is thought of by many as the Avatar of Yenid, much in the way that Kela Manesha Khan, the bloody-handed god of the Ashuriani, has its own incarnations on the mortal plane. The comparison is valid, yet also flawed, for there is but one in Kane. Yenid's power waxes with each new death, True enough, but he has but a fraction of his potential realised in real space. Where the avatar of Cain is born from a fallen god, shattered into hundreds of lesser pieces by the struggle with Slanesh, the Yinkan is born from a god yet to fully manifest. It is but a shred of the whispering god's full power. Furthermore, the coalescence of this chimeric figure was a direct result of the fracture of Baltan and the immense psychic trauma that triggered it, a trauma triggered by a demonic intrusion. Some of the reborn's detractors have been bold enough to claim that Yin Khan, far from being the nemesis of Slanesh in physical form, is polluted by the very forces it was intended to bring low. Those who meditate on its strange androgyny have seen a communality with the demons of the Dark Prince. And to the Yanari, this is heresy of the worst sort, and they would demand an honour duel in the fashion of the Semhan tribes to see the matter settled on the spot. 
In times of peace, the Yen Khan will fold itself between dimensions, haunting the periphery of vision as it shimmers in the veil between real space and the warp. Only a surplus of deathly energies can call it forth into the material realm. When the Yen Khan manifests in reality, it does so with a dramatic and shocking burst of negative energies. With a hideous tearing sound that splits the ears, the corpse-strewn battleground cracks and glows white, a towering form bursting from the blood-soaked earth amongst the raging ectoplasmic storm. The Incarn, bane of the lesser races and icon of rebirth for the Aldari, shrieks in triumph at every new intrusion into real space. The incarnation of morbid energies drifts towards its prey amongst a vortex of deathly whispers, a roaring psychic hurricane ripping the life from those who earn its ire. Those Yanari who fight alongside this creature are invigorated by a cold and chilling power, lent the icy determination of the reborn. Mortal foes find their doom closing in, as unstoppable as night. Those not turned to dust at the Incarn's gaze or sent tumbling to the ground as soulless husks are sliced in two by Vilif Zar, the Sword of Souls, a quick silver blade that can change shape at need. It is the largest and most powerful of the crone swords that have been discovered, and it can kill even a greater demon if its strike lands true. The Time of Death Ascendant is the name given by the Yanari to this era of existence that we are currently living in. The Eldar themselves do not count time in the same way as ourselves, another black mark against their breed. But frankly, due to the birth of the Great Scar and the many, how shall we say, revisions to recorded history conducted by our friends and colleagues within the Ordo Kronos, exact dating is somewhat impossible and frankly unnecessary. This timeline of events, however, is linear and accurate in my view and shows the chain of events to this point. The Sign Beyond the Grave In the hidden chamber of Altenash, shall we, Eldred Ulthwan allows his spirit to flow amongst the departed souls of his race that haunt his craft world's infinity circuit. Under the susurrations of countless billions of voices, he hears a swelling pulse, like a deep and distant heartbeat. It gives him hope and sets in motion a chain of events that will see the Aldari race shaken to its core. The Prophecies of the Seer Cassadorus the Anchorite, sequestered in his wraithbone cell, prophesizes the awakening of the God of the Dead. His words are riddles and half-truths, and the Seer Council of Ulfwe debate their implications until a single thread of Terrible potential is winnowed from the rest. Only one amongst them who has the nerve to follow it. Finding common cause with the Harlequins of the Midnight Sorrow, Eldrad Ulthwan enlists the troop of Inriam Spectre into an ingenious and near blasphemous series of heists. The Theft of the Crystal Seers a new rendition of the events of the fall becomes fashionable amongst the performing harlequins of the Laughing God, and tours the craft worlds one after another. It is unlike the traditional cycle, which ends with Slanesh and Kagorak locked in a duel without end. This latest performance has an epilogue that hints at another being joining the cast and eventually overcoming She Who Thirsts. These theatrical portrayals are not the only illusions brought to the mask of the Midnight Sorrow's audiences. After the mask departs the day following the performance, one of the glinting statues from that craft world's dome of crystal seers 
is missing, though few are skilled enough to pierce the veil of illusion left in its place. The Deathly Ritual On the imperial planet of Port Demesnus, the forces of Sam Han and Othwe strike from long-hidden valleys and subterranean arbors, bypassing the cordons that make the planet an imperial navy stronghold. As the Aldari fall upon the population, the Imperium reinforces the planet's defenders a dozen times over. Only the canny Captain Artemis of the Death Watch spots the ruse for what it is, a distraction to allow Eldrad Ulthran and his forces to make use of the planet's moon for their own arcane purposes. Upon Coheria, the stolen crystal seers of the craft worlds are arranged in a ritual formation, each providing a hyperspatial link to the world ship from which it was taken, or rather, to its infinity circuit. The right near's completion and the departed souls of the Aldari craft worlds are channeled across real space to inhabit not spirit stones, but the crystalline grains of sand that cover the moon Coheria. With so many dead souls flaring in such close proximity, the deity Yanid is roused by their blazing beacon of ghost light, and for a moment it seems that the god of the dead may become a reality far before the prophesied time. It is then that the Death Watch under Captain Artemis attack, slaying Imriam Spectre and driving Eldrad Ulthran's ritual wild, moments before its completion. The Eldari are forced to abandon their work and flee. Knights of Revelations That sliver of true consciousness the Eldari have succeeded in waking from Yenid burns across the void, towards Kimura, where a duel of champions is taking place. In the gladiatorial arena of the Crucible, Yavrin is struck by the moat of Yenid's consciousness that transforms her into the high priestess of a new religion. Flight from Kimura Approached by the mysterious Visarch and agreeing to a temporary alliance, Yavrin and her blood brides flee from the anarchy of the arena to the mercenary quarter of Sek Magira. There she finds many of her old allies, from corsair princes to disfigured witches, and organises her escape from the Dark City. Boarding the Lanathriel, which was operating out of Sekmagir, Yevrin calls in every favour she can to ensure her old Corsair crews buy her time. As the lesser craft duel, the shard ships peeling out of the nearby docks on Vex orders, Yevrin makes for the arterial webway portal above the port. Her flagship, though far too large to pass through the portal, rams its prow, bridge and all into the webway gate. As the ship burns and the Cabalite craft pick it apart like blood sharks attacking a stricken leviathan, Yavrin cuts her way free of the prow on the other side of the portal and takes her quartery deep into the webway. A deadly dance... Yavrin finds herself under attack in the webway. It is not Vex agents that hunt her this time, but the pallid horrors known as demonettes. The herald of the Dark Prince, known as the Mask of Slanesh, has been informed of Yavrin's rise and launches a hypnotic attack on the gathered Yenari, forcing them to join a grisly dance with the demonettes and the corpses of those Drakari hunters they have already killed. They are spellbound and their doom looks certain until a strike force of harlequins come to their aid, that same troop that watched her flight in the arena. As a solitaire duels the mask, the Yanare shake off the dire spell and renew their attack. The demons are banished and their voyage renewed. The Tempest Breaks The divinitions of the Council of Baal-Tan, precipitated by the Mask of the Midnight Sorrow, lead them to the once beautiful world of Ursulia. 
an exodite world ravaged by warp storms. There, the demons of Slanesh intend to breach an ancient portal that leads to Beltarn itself. A temporary alliance between the Mask of Slanesh and the greater demon of Corn, known as Scarbrand, sees the hosts of Slanesh and Corn fight the sword wind of Beltarn amongst a raging demon storm. At the battle's height, the portal that leads to Beltarn is smashed open by Scarbrand's axe, allowing the mask to pass through to reach the world ship beyond. Descending from the webway portal at the stern of Beltarn to drift down like a pearl diver heading for the seabed, the mask makes it to the surface of the world ship. From there, she pollutes the craft world's infinity circuit with demons in such number that innate defences of that wraith-bone megastructure are hard-pressed to cope. Slowly, the infinity circuit becomes corrupted, as it is possessed by the very demonic forces it was devised to escape. Strange Salvation even as the Baltani fight with every ounce of their skill to quarantine and cleanse their home of the demon infestation, the Yanari pass through the webway to join forces with them. Yevrin, under attack from a horde of demonettes, breathes out a cold grey mist that dissolves them amongst their horrible keening scream. The parley between Yunari and Beltani is strained, for there are those that wear the armour of the Drakari amongst them. The presence of Jane Zar, who speaks out on Yevrin's behalf, buys enough time for the High Priestess to perform a ritual of her own. The Incarnation of Yenid. Yevrin plunges her hand into the psychoplastic wraithbone skeleton of the world ship, as if it offered no more resistance than water. When she draws it back out, she holds high the crone sword that had been buried in the craft world's spine. The infinity circuit, already racked with pain, begins to shatter and the backlash of deathly energies forms a vortex of terrifying power. From that vortex emerges the Incarn, avatar of the God of the Dead. Its coalescence has a terrible price, however, though Beltan's infinity circuit is cleansed of demons by Yanid's power, the craft world begins to physically break apart. Worse still, Roiling storms of psychic energy boil through the void, joining with the empiric dissonance of several other cataclysmic events to form a large section of the Great Rift. Beltan is saved, but the galaxy itself has paid the price. The Justice of Seers The Seers of Ulfwe open a portal from their dome of crystal seers to its equivalent upon Beltan, destroying the precious and irreplaceable souls of several deceased far seers to do so. It is deemed necessary to ensure the Yanari are rescued from becalmed Beltan before the strife they have sown sees the craft world consumed in the fires of civil war. They are called to account by Ulfwe's Seer Council, as is Eldrad Ulfran, for his arrogance in co-opting the psyches of generations of dead Eldari is beyond countenance. Emissaries from Craftworld Ultensar speak in their defence, revealing that Yenid's nascent consciousness had a hand in allowing them to survive their craft world's millennia-long ordeal in the Eye of Terror. The trial becomes ever more heated as courtly negotiations turn to veiled threats, then to open hostility and even psychic attack. Only the intervention of no lesser seer than Cassadrus the Anchorite, unseen for generations, prevents the council from kin strife of the worst kind. The Yanari and their Ulfwean allies, accompanied by the Ultensari, are allowed to leave on the proviso that they venture into the Eye of Terror, never to return. Exile within the Eye 
Following a rumour regarding the last crown swords, the Yanari take their crusade for the perils of the Eye of Terror to the crown world of Balliol VI. Its once luxurious cities have been long toppled by the powers of chaos, for the world was at the heart of the Aldari Empire at the time of its great fall. To venture there is to risk the worst doom of all, under the claws of Slanesh. But Yevren believes it is worth the cost. Legend states that should all five crown swords be united, Yenid's power will be bolstered beyond measure. Though many of Yevren's reborn are slain en route to the planet, and then, after planet fall, still more at the hands of the demons that prowl that ruined hellscape, it is the Covenite forces of the Homunculi that see her quest grind to a halt. Sent by Vect and his allies to eke out a terrible revenge upon Yvren. They use all manner of vile technologies to attack the Yanare. The Carnage draws a Slaneshi soul hunt to their location. A freeway battle breaks out in which Yvren and her faithful throng are trapped and suffering, but the key to their victory is close at hand, for one of the fabled crone swords is buried nearby. When the Yinkan manifests from the deathly energies of the battle, it rises from the tortured ground, holding that deadly blade and turns the tide. Rescued from the Brink a Wraith Knight-led delegation from Craftworld Ayandan reinforces the Yanare before the Slaneshi Horde can close the noose. They had read the runes of fate, divining that a critical moment of history would occur upon Balliol VI. Well versed in the hidden ways of the Crone World from their spirit stone harvests, they led the Yanare through a hidden portal to the battle-scarred worldship of Yandan. The Flames of Ashurian The forces of chaos are attacking from the Great Rift all across the galaxy, and Craftworld Iandan is no exception. Even as the Yanari is held as an honoured guest, in effect a prisoner, by the rightfully cautious leaders of Iandan, the Craftworld is assailed by a Nurgle fleet. From her sumptuous cell, Yevrin sends a psychic summons to a nearby Corsair fleet, and within a matter of days it joins the battle. Together with the Royal Armada of Ayandan under Prince Yarel, the fleet prevents the Nurgle ships from reaching the craft world. The famous Autark leads a boarding action into the depths of the Nurgle flagship, a demon engine of colossal size known to the Aldari as the Spawn of Agonothair. He plunged the Spear of Twilight into the heart of that rotting hulk, killing the demon creature within it, but paid for it with his life. Smashed to ruin by a blow from the demon prince Gura Gugal Gur. Death and resurrection. Prince Yarel's body is recovered and brought back to Iandan, there to be lain in state. However, the corpse is infested with a virulent disease that could potentially lie low the craft world entire. Fortunately, the spirit seer Ayana Adrenal allows Yevrin into Yarel's mausoleum. There she burns out the plague with the energies of death before claiming Yarel's spear, the fourth of the crown swords she seeks, and resurrecting the prince with the power of rebirth. Iandan's course through history is altered forever by that fell time. Its farseers cast their runes, but now the dwindling threads of potential that had seemed to throttle their future unravel into a dozen different futures and more. The Fated Moon A council of elders gathers in the aftermath of Yerel's resurrection. Together, they discuss the new doom that faces the galaxy. After long debate, they come to the conclusion that only by giving the teeming masses of humanity a fighting chance to hurl back the forces of the ruinous powers 
Can they avert a doom that would see their race suffer and die? The Yanare, now bolstered by a large contingent from Ayandan, brave the shattered spars of the webway once more. After a fraught journey where they were forced to face the legendary Azek Araman and his thousand sons Automata in battle, they reached the ice moon of Classis, that frozen orb which had appeared large in the divinations of their seers. There they rendezvous with the Imperial agents under Inquisitor Greyfax and Arch Magus Dominus Belisarius Call. A pact is struck, and together the Allies head for Macrag, there to resurrect a demigod that can lead humanity in its darkest hour. The Heart of a Rival Empire in the fortress of Hera upon Macrag, Yevrin kills the Primarch Rebute Gilliman. In doing so, she finally dispels the shadow of his brother Fulgrim's poisonous betrayal, only to then resurrect him by channeling Yanid's power into his fallen form. Though she has failed to unite the Eldari race as she had hoped, with the resurrection of Gilliman, she binds the race of mankind together at a critical moment that gives hope to the galaxy at large. The danger to the Imperium of a united and reinvigorated Eldar race is clear, particularly when led by a warp entity of such potential power. Alternatively, this could be some grand ruse by the Dark Prince, as there is merit in the words of the Eldar conservatives who oppose the Yanari, in that this Incarn avatar does share striking similarities to the Prince of Pleasure. That being said, this may simply be a true reflection of the Eldar spirit in the warp, as Slanesh is also the true representation of the evil souls that inhabit these creatures. So some similarities in appearance of these demonic entities, and that's what they are, are to be expected. The Eldar have dabbled in the affairs of man, using us when they can for their own ends, which is one of the reasons their actions should be distrusted. They are a species unable to act in pure altruism, so prevalent is the witch taint in their very alien blood. We as guardians must be suspicious when they willingly risk themselves to raise a half-dead Primarch and use the power of their god to raise him. Although I have no doubt as to the wisdom and loyalty of our noble Primarch, for many of his associates, namely Kor, I do not have such trust. The Primarch Gilliman appears to have placed the Imperium on a neutral stance to the Eldar, one which none but the most zealous xenophobe amongst us are likely to challenge, given our current predicament with the affairs around the Great Rift and the Imperium at large. However, it would be unwise for we who watch and judge to not give a side eye when our current Lord Commander and Regent was killed and then resurrected by a Xenos witch, which seeks to reforge one of the potentially most dangerous enemies of mankind. We know he has met with the Eldar during the Indomitus Crusade to discuss the removal of his armour and whether it would kill him. Clearly, it did not. Whatever the future, for the present the Eldar is still disunited and in open conflict with each other. I hear that the Jokari forces dispatched by Vect to eliminate Yevrin under the command of Drazar is near to hunting her down, although with the Phoenix Lord Jane Zar to protect her, it is unlikely this attempt will succeed. But at least we know that Vect is unlikely to bend the knee to this new religion, and thus the major part of the Aldari will oppose it. But if this god is to manifest folly, who can say what an Eldar, suddenly given hope, would do? As ever, my lord, I am your most loyal 
the servant, Inquisitor A.B. Prince. Thanks for watching everybody. If you enjoy this content, please do remember to subscribe and like the video. Thank you to everybody supporting the channel. You can see your names here. And if you would like to join them, please consider using the links below. I will see you soon for more videos. The vote recently for a law subject for the next big, big law video is going to be the Indomitus Crusade. And that is a big subject and may span into several hours and several videos. Now I've actually looked over what I would potentially do with that. So stay tuned. That sort of stuff's coming up soon. Probably a small law video uh, very soon about one uh, Alpha Primaris, a servant of the arch-heretic Belisarius Call. See you next time. Cheers.